Good morning, brothers and sisters. We're going to begin this study here as we do a review of the book of Judges. Uh, can we begin with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for the time that we have uh, each morning uh, to study together. And we're thankful for the light that you have given us. We just ask, Lord, that we can sort through um, all of the truths, all of these precious jewels, and put them in a setting that they can be seen clearly. We need your wisdom and understanding. We need your power in our lives. We need your Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We pray for this movement, for the brothers and sisters in it. Um, we know, Lord, that uh, at the present time, there's a lot of division. But we know that you have promised uh, that we can be united to do this work. And we just pray that um, these studies we have will further that end. Be with us now, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can probably notice, I have a bit of a cold. I had a cough last night, so that's lowered my voice a little bit. I sound like my oldest son. Um, so, what? No, okay. So what we're going to do, I'll switch, uh, I'll share the screen here. And we're just going to quickly look at the first three judges. And this is Judges chapter 3. Now, the first part, uh, the preamble to this section, um, it talks about that God has left the nations to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel has had not known all the wars of Canaan. So remember, they had um, 40 years earlier, they had come out of Egypt and they had, well, I'm not sure exactly what year this is, but for some of the people, they hadn't been involved in that. So only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. So some of these people had not experienced war. So I don't know if we we have exactly where we can place this. I think Stephen in his studies, I mean, this is after the death of Joshua. So how, how long would this be then? Joshua was 110 when he died. And he would have been, so this would be 30, some 30 years after they possessed the land. Right? Am I correct there? Um, well, I have Joshua die at, at the longest. There are 24 years in the land. Okay. And the, elder, the elders, how long they live after that, we can only guess, maybe 20, 30 years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is, this is quite a while after. So many of these people didn't know the War of the Canaanites. Now it says, namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians, the Hivites, that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove or to test Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, <coughs> which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. So if we're going to line this up with our history, where would we align this up? Wouldn't we look to line this up 2002, 2003, and 2004? Okay. Um, well, definitely we could, if we're, if we're going to look at this, this is sort of going back a little bit. 
All right. Judges 2 is going to start with 9-11. That's when you're going to have these uh, judges, these messages that come to this movement. But this is going back a little bit. It's showing us the condition that had existed. So this would be um, the history preceding the time of the end in our line and that period from the time of the end to 9-11. So that's the spiritual condition of the Adventist church. Would we agree with that? Yes. So this is the context in with which this movement now is going to have these messages. And the problem that we've had is that, um, and when we studied this, this, this history in connection with um, examining the foundation. Jeff and, and all of us prior to 9-11, uh, there was lots that we had inherited from Adventism in our thinking, in our beliefs, um, that slowly began to be undone after 9-11. Doesn't mean that the message that Jeff had prior to 2-9-11 was, was essentially wrong or anything like that. But there were these assumptions that he had brought to his understanding. And the, and the one particularly is that the Sunday law is just going to come almost out of nowhere. He knew that um, the Sunday law was coming. That's what he was looking for. But seeing it afar off, it's like when you're driving into a city I mean, the city on the map is just sort of a point. As you drive closer, you start to zoom in to the way marks. And that's what was happening um, with this movement after 9-11. We started to approach uh, the Sunday law. And as we approached the Sunday law, we started to see it in more detail. And, that's, and we can see that clearly in how Jeff took these three way marks and kept uh, focusing in or zooming in as we move through history. Now, so this would be the condition of the church. We are in apostasy, the Seventh-day Adventist church. We basically have alliances with other Christians who don't think like we do, and it's influenced our understanding. So this could represent the whole history of Adventism up until 9-11. Would, would we agree with that? Interesting perspective. Okay. So now we're going to have these different messages. And we're going to have um, an enemy. And an enemy is a message or a belief or an understanding that the movement has to address. And so it's going to be addressed by another message. So we're going to take it that Othniel is going to show that history beginning with 9-11. And when we looked at this before, we saw the work of the Holy Spirit being illustrated. I don't know if people remember that. But it says here, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushran Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushran Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushran Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushran Rishathaim. And the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So what symbols did we look at? Uh, what did we have to look at with this verse? We had the names.
right? So we have Othniel. And the name of Othniel means what? Um, it means uh, the force of God. Okay. So I think the idea that we had there is this referred to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, but is it also not <clears throat> what we see after 9-11 or at 9-11? Because the towers coming down <clears throat> were, were something that was from that which was ordained of God, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Othniel also means the line of God. Okay. <clears throat> um. Now, when it comes to Kushrath, Kushan Reshathayin, such a terrible name to have to read, um, it means double wickedness. So, <clears throat> if this is double wickedness, is this also not a type of two horns? Two horns. Mm. Explain what you're thinking there. Well... America's, the, the two horns that were to be applied with America were Protestantism and um, Republicanism, right? Yeah. So if you have double wickedness, is this not the antithesis of Protestantism and Republicanism? Um. Okay, I'm not sure how we would apply that if we're applying this to this movement. Um, but maybe what, okay, so prior to 9-11, we're looking for the Sunday law. We're looking for the evangelicals, the moral majority, to bring in the Sunday law. And out of nowhere comes these planes and totally changes everything for Seventh-day Adventists, as far as I'm concerned. We now don't quite understand what's happening, those that are studying scripture. And it takes time to understand what this event is. We know it's an important event. Um, now, we know that we already have 1989, the time of the end. And now we have 9-11. And um, God is going to have to correct this movement in this period of time. But the message the message that is influencing us um, is this double wickedness. Now, could it be, if you're going to try to apply it to the two horns, that we're influenced by Protestantism and Republicanism, that Adventists being conservative are conservative evangelicals and conservative Republicans? Or people in this movement are influenced by that? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm... The kind of wickedness that we're talking about, just like what we saw with this in the time of Christ, you have on one side the Sadducees, mm -hmm. and you have on the other side the Pharisees. Now you have all sorts of other groups on the fringes, yeah, the the scenes, the Herodians, the Zealots. Right. The five, five groups. Now, the Sadducees wish to continue in power because they have the money. Mm -hmm. And they also have possession of the temple. They're, the Pharisees have their position on the law and they believe that the law is the most important thing but it's the corrupted law not the true law not the pure law how much have we seen the adventist church exhibit exactly those two same positions
Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> there are those <clears throat> that look to be conservative within the church that want to follow every little thing that they see as being correct and proper, even when it is corrupted. And you have those within the church that view the authority of the church to be absolute. Well, okay. Now, the other thing is um, Jeff, prior to 9-11, he's really just a part of the um, the present truth uh, faction of Adventism. <coughs> Excuse me here. I mean, he's not much different than other Adventists. He can he can speak to Adventist churches. Uh, people are accepting what he's saying, but. Adventists are sort of following all these different winds of doctrine. Adventists don't have a discernment that is they can listen to contradictory truths and say amen to both, right? Agreed. Because all Adventists are involved in is a more us and them uh, position for the most part. That's my perspective on Adventism. Um, going to camp meetings, seeing, you know, completely different preachers with different ideas. And Adventists aren't able to discern. And so Jeff's message isn't really very effective prior to 9-11. And the people who are following him, reading, uh, you know, future news, um, after 9-11, many of those people are going to leave. That is, he's constantly, as he's advancing in light, um, he's making a separation between himself and conservative Adventism. Would we agree with that? Certainly. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we if if we look at some things that were going on about that time. Mm-hmm. Elder Jeff was studying beginning under the time that Robert Falkenberg was president. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we're all aware by now that Falkenberg did some things that he would have preferred to have swept under the rug and kept secret. Mm -hmm. Now, we come to Jan Paulson. Jan Paulson was very forthcoming in the fact that he viewed his spiritual mentor to be Edwin Heppenstall. Yeah. Heppenstall was quite direct that his spiritual understanding came from his reading and knowledge of W.W. Prescott. Mm-hmm. And Prescott was the one that was very direct in 1919 in saying that he hoped to never again have to give a presentation based on chronology and prophecy. He was His clarity was to say, I hope to never again have to give a sermon of the 2300 days. Mm-hmm. So by the time you have this situation with Jan Paulson, you have a group that is now basing their understanding and their faith on the desire that they have to be more like the Protestants, the apostate Protestants in the world. Yeah. And of course, we have um, the spiritual formation, September of 2001. That's a requirement for any of our ministers. 
Right. But who was <clears throat> of of the vice presidents of the general conference that voted for this on spiritual formation? Who was one of those vice presidents? I don't know. Ted Wilson. Oh, he speaks out against spiritual formation. But he voted for spiritual formation. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> what you wind up with, and the, the only one I really didn't address there was Ted Wilson's father, Neil Wilson. But when you take a look at these presidents of the general conference in order, beginning at Neil Wilson, <clears throat> to Falkenberg, to Paulson, to Ted Wilson, you have the abominations that you see within Ezekiel 8. Yeah. And that's the progression of the church. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have Elder Jeff. Right. Very much, <clears throat> very much like John the Baptist, one crying in the wilderness but very much like Isaiah and very much like um, Elijah pointing out the issues that are occurring and calling people to a true worship. Yeah. Now we know that 9-11 marks because we have it marking the Sunday law in a sense, right? Because Revelation 18 is supposed to be about the Sunday law. That's how Ellen White sees it. But we have the mighty angel of Revelation coming down at 9-11. At and yet we don't have a Sunday law there per se. We do have uh, types of the Sunday law, right? So we have uh, the Patriot Act, things like that. And we know the world has completely changed because of 9-11. None of the other developments could have occurred without 9-11. So people were willing to trade, trade uh, their freedom for safety. So now we have um, this message from God that comes results from 9-11, and it's the work of the Lion of God, which, which represents uh, prophecy, right? The line of the tribe of Judah that's going to unseal the seals. Now, is this really when we start to unseal Millerite history? I mean, prior to that, Jeff, of course, had a line with Millerite history, but he hadn't begun looking at the details of Millerite history until 9-11. Right. Right. So because that's going to bring out August 11th, 1840. So we're now going to start looking at the way marks rather than just the time of the end and um, matching that up and trying to understand, you know, the close of probation. Because originally Jeff had, as Ellen White does, that um, the loud cry parallels the midnight cry, which comes um, after the Sunday law. So Jeff wasn't really, prior to 9-11, really fully understanding these lines that occurred in Millerite history. We didn't have all these way marks. So that's going to start to unfold. And that's going to be the line of the tribe of Judah that's going to unfold these things. Now we have this Kushan, Kushan Rishathayim. He's the king of Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers. Um, now that's usually going to be the the Tigris and the Tigris and the Euphrates, that often is is understood as Mesopotamia, between those two rivers. Um, so he would represent this type of wickedness that has come into Adventism, and nine eleven is going to um, introduce a work that is now going to begin a reforming, not just of, not just for Adventists in general, but more specifically for conservative Adventists, for the, um, the ones following Jeff. And, and Jeff is going to continue to, to gain people and lose people as he moves through this history. I mean, one of the things interesting about Jeff's ministry 
is it never really grows. I mean, it grows and then it wanes and it grows and it wanes because Jeff is following advancing light and many people are not willing to follow advancing light. They're willing to follow light that the church is unhappy with to make them think that they're better than the church. And, and that's half, often how Adventists look at things. They compare themselves with others and feel because they're better than others, that means they're right with God. But what's, what's happening here is a, a deeper consecration. The work of the Holy Spirit is going to begin after 9-11. And we understand that because what, how does Jeff characterize 9-11? What happens at 9-11? We get the sprinklings, the first sprinklings of the latter rain, correct? Right. Yeah. So prior to that, Jeff is operating um, by studying uh, the past. He understands by studying the Bible in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, that um, we're repeating Millerite history, but he doesn't understand the details of Millerite history yet. And it's going to be the sprinkling of the latter rain that's going to bring this light. <coughs> Now, um, so we have uh, Othniel, and then we have Ehud. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So we're going to say that uh, the city of palm trees is a reference to Jericho to the seven times. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. And But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. He brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. So uh, we're going to have to go over this again to remind everybody what this is about. Um, and he said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And he who came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And he who said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat. And he who put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. And Ehud went forth through the porch, and shut the doors of the parlor upon him, and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor, and therefore they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Sirath, or Sirath. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. And he said unto them, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab, and he suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day 
under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. So there's a lot in here, and we took a lot of time uh, to look at this. So what, what are the characteristics of Ehud and Eglon, king of the Moabites? Well, for one, we have symbols of the seven times. Right. So if we, if we have symbols of the seven times, are we seeing this as to the oppression that had come upon Israel, or is this something different? Well, I, I would think here the seven times, obviously, Israel um, experiences the seven times, but they repent, right? So they don't have the full force of all of these uh, chastisements come upon them, right? That happens later. But um, I think just as far as the symbols here applying to our movement, would this refer to... Um, the understanding of uh, Leviticus 26. In what part of, of Leviticus 26? Well, it's just the seven times itself because of the city of palm trees, Jericho. Okay. We have an understanding now this movement um, begins to understand the 2520. Now, it's in response to Eglon, king of Moab, and we'd have to understand what, what he represents. But we have lots of symbols here. So we have a left-handed uh, person who's of the tribe of Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. Um, and he has this dagger. It's a double-edged sword, right, two edges. It's a cubit long. And... When we are these are often symbols that we use in reference to uh, the seven times the idea of measuring the idea of um, the doubling right a mirror um, and then there's there's a bunch of symbolism here regarding um, this uh, parlor and where he ends up, he's going to go out uh, between, uh, where is it here? Um, and went forward through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and lock them. Now, there's going to be this key that's going to be talked about. Yeah, because if you're if you're going to lock a door, you've got to have some kind of a key in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and so we have a key opening up a door, and this this brings us to to Christ, who has uh, that's Isaiah twenty two twenty three, uh, Revelation uh, chapter three, dealing with the message um, uh, to. Um, the Philadelphian church. Um, now there's also a key to the prophetic charts. But would this be a, a deeper understanding of the charts that's being talked about? I mean, I know we've dealt with a lot of these details here much more closely than what we're doing here. I would think that it would have to be. Yeah. Now we also have this reference to Gilgal. Um, Again, so Gilgal, we know that's going to start at 9-11. So what particularly happens here? He's going to... Um, uh, where is it here? I saw it earlier. Yeah, so it says in verse 18, 
And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. So, um, so he's going to leave as well, right? Is he going to leave or is he sending people away? Well, it says he's sending people away, but it says that he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. So I'm not really sure. I, I think we looked at when we looked at this before, I don't think we were really sure what was happening. <laughs> Whether he, he leaves, but then he goes back. I mean, that's what it seems because he's going to turn right shuv he turned himself again that is he's going to turn 180 go back he himself turned again from the quarries that were by gilgal so this is going to be a symbol of revelation 18 the mighty angel coming down Anybody with thoughts on this? Now, remember, this is the Moabites. Um, who are the Moabites? Children of Lot. Yeah, children of Lot. and um, But they're still enemies of Israel. Correct. Even though they're relations. Um, so who would, who would they represent in this history, if we're going to look at um, the history of, let's say, 2005? What is the message that is being fought against? is being countered by an understanding of the 2520 what what are what what's adventist attitude toward millerite history an embarrassment okay, it's an embarrassment adventists generally don't study millerite history and if they do, it's very cursory. That is, we don't read the writings of William Miller or Joshua V. Himes or any of these people. Adventists don't read anything Samuel Snow wrote, basically. I mean, they might know the name, but they wouldn't know anything of the circumstances. Adventists don't understand how, where the first and second angel's messages are placed. Uh, we don't understand any of this. So how can, what can Eglon, the king of Moab, how can he represent this? I mean, his name means calf-like. Well, <clears throat> okay, calf-like. Is this not like the, the golden calves? Mm -hmm. Is this not like the golden calf that Aaron constructed while Moses was on the mount receiving the law is this not a symbol of apostate protestant understanding of how to study the bible right and see that's the thing about being an adventist i mean i've been an adventist a long time and you know when i first heard this message it was um a light that went on because I had never looked at Millerite history and I didn't understand our history. To me, the pioneers were Jones and Wagner and Loughborough and people like that. Um, I never really looked at Miller or Josiah Litch or Hiram Edson or any of these people. 
So we have a light that's coming to Adventism. But the problem is Adventism is only interested in being like the other churches. And often the people who are in the movement, um, the reason why they're opposed to the church is not necessarily for uh, good reason or pure reasons. It's often sim simply jealousy. And I've seen this happen so many times that people who are opposed to the church, um, if they uh, get power in the church, if somehow they end up being an elder, it does happen, um, they now are very oppressive and controlling. And all the things that they criticize the church of doing, they're, they're worse. Because people seem to want to have control over other people. And so we have a party spirit that exists within Adventism, that exists within humanity. And when we look at this, this understanding that's going to come from the 2520, um, it's shedding light upon Millerite history that we wouldn't have had without it. It's going to start, uh, and it's going to start creating alienation uh, between Jeff's ministry and other conservative ministries that have been interested in what Jeff is doing. And it's definitely going to be, the church is going to strongly oppose the 2520, but it's mostly conservative Adventists who are strongly opposing it. People like Steve Wahlberg. Right now that, that opposition is going to come a bit later because it's going to take time to develop this understanding of the 2520. It's basically going to be seven years from when Jeff first presents the 2520 till we get the disfellowship that happens um, in regard to the 2520. Now, what about um, Ehud himself? So his name uh, means um, united. He's the son of Gira, which is a grain. And he's a Benjamite, which is son of the right hand, but he's left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, why are they do doing this? Why is Ehud, who is a judge, why is he giving a present to the king of Eglon? How would we apply this to what our our movement has been had been doing at that time? Because remember, this is a message. Is he seeking to give a message to wake up? The um, the king of Moab. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so this dagger that has two <coughs> two edges. <coughs> this dagger that has two edges. Excuse me. Um, which is in a, a cubit in length, so we'd say eighteen inches. Um, this is going to represent a study of God's word, an approach to God's word that is going to take down this other message. Would we agree with that? That's a good point. And it, and it has to do with measuring. And, so, it and so it has to do with chronology. Yes. Right. So, of course, the 2520 definitely has to do with chronology. <clears throat> And we have this less left and right uh, uh, thing that happens again. So this, um, so left and right is a mirror, isn't it? It can be, yes. Mm -hmm. So 
So then he's going to, to deliver this message. So this would refer to a message being delivered to Adventists, would it not? And is that what happens in that history? Is it a message delivered to Adventists or is it a message delivered outside of the Adventism? Um, why outside of Adventism? I mean, the well, 2520 is delivered to Adventists. Okay, agreed. Mm -hmm. But the dagger is going to be used on the king of Moab. Yeah, which represents an alliance with a false system of studying God's word. Right. Now, in the chat, comment was made on Isaiah 30.21. Why? Why are we... Why should we consider this in, in conjunction with this study? Because it says, uh, thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, which is like the midnight cry, or you know, the past truths relating to present truths, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. I mean, so this is a message that guides God's people. Right. Okay, so we're going to have this dagger, which is going to represent uh, a method of study. And it's going to be related to um, the seven times, right? Even though... Um, when we look at this here, um, the children of Ammon, the children of Ammon, went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So this is a message about the seven times, and it's going to be um, the children of Ammon and the children of Amalek that possess, possess the city of palm trees. And so Israel is going to serve Eglon 18 years. Um, What, what would this 18 years be? What does that symbolize? Anybody have any ideas? I know in the Gospels it mentioned a woman that was humped, humped over for 18 years and Christ said that she had been oppressed by Satan that amount of time. And then 18 is six plus six plus six, so. Okay, so it's six plus six plus six. Yeah. So that's that's the way I would look at the 18 years. It's going to, and, and we have, yeah, that's Luke 13, 16 um, and Luke 13, 11, where it's gonna mention the 18 years. So there, she's going to be loosed from her bondage. And, and this is going to happen on the Sabbath day. So can we relate these two together?
So what's the, what's the darkness? What's the error? I mean, we know it has to do with um, Eglon, the king of Moab, which is a false method of study, a false worship. It's going to symbolize the worship of the golden calf. And it's going to be 18 years, 6 plus 6 plus 6. And we know that 9-11 begins the Sunday law. Right? As we zoom in to the Sunday law way mark, our history is a line that illustrates that Sunday law. When I mean our line, that's just the line below the big line, not some of the other smaller lines. That's the main line that Jeff saw, is we have the time of the end, and it's going to proceed. It's the first and second angel's messages are going to be repeated in order to prepare Adventists for the Sunday law. And as he begins to look at Millerite history, because of the charts, and because of the 2520, um, we are now going to be able to counter that message that has affected Adventists. So again, with this verse 19, dealing with him uh, turning again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. And this is what I understand, is he sends people away, they go to their own homes, right? That's the idea, and that he's going to go to the quarries that were by Gilgal. So what are the quarries? Places where we dig up truths, like the rocks being the truths that we're finding. Well, in this case... Gilgal means a turning point, right? Well, yeah. But here, the word quarries refers to uh, graven images. Oh, right. so turning away from idols. Yeah. So the quarries here, it means an idol carved graven image quarry, right? Because a graven image is carved from stone. So he's going to go uh, walking back and he sees these graven images by Gilgal. So... He then says, I have a secret errand unto the king, unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out. So he's going to go and leave, but then he's going to come back and tell the king that he has a secret errand. Now, the idea here is, uh, the idea of secret here means to cover uh, Backbiting, covening, covert, disguise, hiding place, privily, protection, secret. Um, so I think the idea is that he's trying to tell the king that he has a message for him uh, to protect him. At least that's what I would gather from that. And that's why, um, so king says, well, don't tell me we, we have to get rid of the other people here. So he's going to send the other people out. And then Ehud's going to come, and the king's going to be sitting in a summer parlor, um, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat, and he put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Right. So he's going to kill him. Uh, it's quite graphic. And... And then Ehud's going to go through the porch. It is a colonnade or a row of pillars. And shut the doors. So what is this shutting of the doors? Uh, it's like a close of probation. But when you when you mention mention the, the the pillars, it reminds me of Nashville. 
the the temple at Nashville mm -hmm. and the buildings with pillars. Yeah. Now, of course, we're not applying this here to that history yet, but I think it is partly prefigured. Um, now, we know that is there a close of probation for the Adventist church at 9-11? Yes. Yeah. And, but yet that message has to be given to the church. So one of the things that this message does in that history um, from 9-11 to 2005, to the understanding of the 2520, um, is that it gives a message to the church that says the Adventist church has been passed by. Now, in a sense, it was passed by in 1989, but it's going to be uh, the, the, the structure is going to be passed by. That is, they have closed their probation as a church. Okay, as a question. Mm-hmm. Do these examples that we're looking at within Judges also interrelate to some of the things that we see in Ezekiel 8? Yes. Yeah, because that's what I was saying, is that this is a type of the Sunday Law. And so the Sunday Law begins at 9-11. And so we can take that history of Ezekiel 8 and we can see that progression that occurs with the Sunday law, with the abominations. Right. Right. So with the false worship, and we see that in Adventism. We can take it as the four generations, but we can also see that um, when this message is given. See, here, here's the problem. I mean, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and, you know, I believe in the Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, it's God's denominating people. And yet we can see quite clearly that the Adventist church is not on track. There might be individuals who, um, you know, are are spiritual, but for the most part, people are just trusting in the fact that they're Adventists. Exactly. No real interest in studying. The church itself um, has, you know, basically turned into a hierarchy. It used to be partly congregational and partly hierarchical. Um, but the congregational aspect is being removed. That is, individual churches have little power over what pastor they're going to get. What we're seeing more and more is the acceptance of the image of jealousy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, so, yeah. When, when Neil Wilson made his comment that there are only two truly catholic organizations in the world one the roman church and one the adventist church he was giving his opinion that the the seventh day adventist church was no different than the roman church well i i don't take his statement to mean that i i think he's talking about the fact that the adventist church is everywhere it's universal i would agree with him then I mean, the, 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 the second comment that he had made was his thought that he liked to call his vice presidents his cardinals. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but I don't take it the way you're taking it. All right. Right. I don't think that he's saying, you know, that we're, we're like the Catholics. He just looks at the fact that at, in his mind, which I think is a prideful thing, very um, much that the Adventist Church is has covered the earth with with the message of Adventism. We have we're in every country. We have schools. We have hospitals. Our institutions have spread abroad, and that's true. You don't see that with other churches. Uh, the other Protestant churches have sort of divided up the world. Some churches work in one area. Some churches in another area, and they try not to work the same field. Adventists cover the world. So I, I, I believe that's what he's talking about. But um, I don't think that that's the issue here in the sense that, um, you know, what he's talking about. This is a message that goes to the fact that the Adventist church has been passed by. And now as Adventists, we, we can't 
depend upon the organization if we ever could because a new order the books of a new order have already been established adventism is in darkness you go to our abcs and um all you see for the most part are protestant books you see a few adventist books off in the corner if they're going to be on prophecy they're generally going to be scholarly works that nobody's really interested in reading and, and then Ellen White's just rele relegated to a corner, right? So Adventism has not, not given, even though it's covered the world, it's giving a message that's pretty much like the world. It's done it at a cost. And the Adventist church tends to compromise so that it can work in other places in the world. It doesn't stand by principle. <clears throat> okay, so we have Ehud, there's lots of symbols here. Um, the, the land is going to have rest for 80 years, and then we're going to have Shamgar, which there isn't much mentioned here about him. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad. And he also delivered Israel. So we're going to have these three judges. So what's the ox goad? Like a prod? Yeah, so it's it's something to, to goad an ox, so it's like a stick. Well, it's a, a, like a pointed stick, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to kill 600 Philistines with this ox goad. So he's it's pretty amazing. Um. As far as the meaning of his name, uh, means a sword, and uh, son of Anath, which is um, an answer. And then he's going to have 600 men that he's going to, to kill. So this is going to be related to uh, what part of the message? It really doesn't get the point of the 2520. Uh, what do you, what do you mean? Well, isn't I mean the twenty five twenty is a very a direct very pointed kind of a message. Okay, well we know that the number six uh, is an overplus that is beyond the five <coughs> or the fingers of the hand. Right, so we have five fingers, and that that word six is referring to an overplus. One above five. <clears throat> and the word hundred um, means uh, a multiplicative and a fraction. So, so we can see here that this, these words here refer to um, an understanding of chronology as well. <clears throat> okay.
So uh, we see there, if we take Samson and, Sh and Shamgar, uh, there's 4,030 4, plus Shamgar is 600 would be 4,630. What would be the significance of 4,630? Why would we add them together? <coughs> so how is that significant? Why would you add uh, Shamgar and Samson together. Well, Samson, because of his strength. Mm -hmm. And what would 4630 mean? I'm puzzling that out right now. I don't, I'm not understanding. Yeah. I don't know if, if I would do that. Um, I don't see any significance in it. But what we have is we have these, these first judges. And would they tie together as a group of three? They are within the chapter. Yeah. But would we place them from 9-11 to 2005? And this would be about um, a message that comes from Adventism that we have to overcome. That has affected the movement. Well, at that point, by 2005, we started to see that the, the church was not accepting of much of, of what was being presented. Because by, by 2005, Elder Jeff was coming to the understanding of the importance of the seven times. He'd been using the charts, he'd been translating the charts into other languages when he spoke. Yeah. So there was quite a bit that was going on that was beginning to wake people up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to start drawing these lines, and as we go through them, we'll just add to it. Okay. <clears throat> so over here, we have 2001. Okay. 11. And then we're going to have um, an increase of light, because every time you have... And, and that's what we have to understand. Is this the second angel arriving or is this the empowerment of the first angel in the context of what we're doing here? So we're going to have uh, Othniel. Um, Ehud and Shamgar. Right. So these... This is a threefold message, right? Um, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. 
right? Agreed. And, that, and that's going to lead us to repentance. Because that's one of the things, but it's sin, righteousness, and judgment. And um, this work of the Holy Spirit is going to be this increase of light. Right? Then we have Ehud, and this is going to be the seven times. And then Shamgar um, is going to relate to the giving of this message. That is, we now have an ox goat. And this ox goat is, even though his name means a sword, an ox goat is much more primitive, right? Exactly. So how would this relate then? What is, why, that, why is it an ox goat when his name means a sword? You're saying it's because it's a pointed message. Correct. Okay. So this this here is all going to occur from 2001 to 2005. Well, I guess technically I'm doing it inclusively five years. Right. <clears throat> now remember uh, when they come to understand 9/11. It's also going to be in this history. That is, it takes them time to sort out what 9-11 was about. So some of the things we understand about 9-11, they originally started to understand it, but it's going to develop. So in this history here, the lines are much simpler. But once he has 9-11, and we're going to see this in the next Judges, <coughs> that's when he's going to have... 9-11 as the center way mark. It's going to have time at the end here and the Sunday law here. And that's going to develop into this. But as we know, he continues to zoom in. Right Before they had time at the end, Sunday law, close of probation. Once he has 9-11, he's going to zoom in here. And then later he's going to zoom in and, and put another way mark here, midnight cry and get rid of the time of the end, as far as looking at the lines themselves, the three-step testing prophetic message. And then we're going to have to try to sort that out. But it's going to be in this next history that we're going to see this. And it's not just 9-11, it's also the 2520 that helps us to understand these truths. So is the 2520 a key? I've always thought that it was a type of a key, yes. Yeah, it's definitely a key. Without the 2520, uh, we wouldn't have almost any of our message. I mean, there are people who, you know, believe that, um, you know, we should be conservative Adventists and we need to look back to the pioneers and so forth. But understanding Millerite history, we don't understand it without the 2520. So this seven times, uh, this is going to lead to the Holy Spirit giving us an understanding of the seven times. And now we're going to begin primitively, but to understand how to use Miller's rules. Because, I mean, was Jeff using Miller's rules prior to 9-11? I would need to say yes. So he was. But Miller's rules also needed to expand. That is, there are uh, principles that are in his rules that we now understand more deeply. Would you agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. And, and Jeff already had started to do that. He already had started to recognize... Um, uh, the triple application of prophecy, which is not something that Miller explicitly talks about, but is the principle laid out by Lewis F. Weir. Uh, but it comes from Miller's rules. 
And so the line upon line aspect um, is going to be more deeply understood in this history as we get the seven times. It's going to help us to begin to draw these lines and understand them uh, to see that we are, um, as Jeff came to understand, that each waymark is a line in and of itself. You can zoom in onto a waymark and you will find a line. The problem was sorting out exactly which line we were talking about. So we're going to start, you know, going through these things, filling in this history with these judges. Um, one of our main goals, though, is to see what we learn about Samson. That's why we're reviewing this, because Samson uh, is unique among the judges with the amount of detail, the number of stories that occur, but also what it illustrates. Uh, Samson is a type of repeat and enlarge. So... Now, when we looked at Deborah and Barak, um, we started to look at a history that was uh, dealing with Parminder, right? Right. Now, um, so we're, we're going to look at this in more detail tomorrow, but just to kind of, uh, I want people to sort of look ahead, read this over maybe even watch some of the, the videos that we had done before. But we have this understanding um, that's going to develop in this next period of time. And right? He's going to pretend to be a champion of the 2520. Yeah, he's going to reject everything that he ended up presenting in those uh, 20 presentations. But he's going to do these 20 presentations, which um, I believe were done in 2010. <coughs> he might have started in 2009, but I only know of them happen. Now, his, uh, his presentations, I think you're right, that they started somewhere in 2009, but became prevalent in 2010. I, I know he presented in 2010. Right. So it's, um, they had 2009 because this was Tess trying to give 10 years uh, from 2009 to 2019. But I'm not sure that she's correct about the 2009 date. So I haven't found any evidence that he presented the seven times in 2009. Now, Parminder's in this movement before 9-11. Um, so he had been in the movement for quite a long time. Um, so Jeff had known him for a long time, known of him. Uh, you also have his brother, um, which is the first person I ever watched present in this movement was uh, uh, his brother, which I can't think of his name. The other Bayant. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers his name. But, you know, he never got as involved, especially later on. I haven't really heard anything from him. I don't know what he thinks about the movement. Um, so... Uh, Magit. Yeah, that's it, Magit. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, so we're going to have this story of Deborah and Barak. So Parminder is working behind the scenes for a long time. And um, so what we're going to have here is Jabin, the king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host is Sisera, right? So when we look at Jabin, 
this is a representation of what power? The Roman power? Yeah, so we understood that the Jabin king of Canaan represents papal understanding. Now, in uh, the response to this, we're going to have these deliverers, Deborah and Barak. So we need to understand what they are. And um, so this is going to go to this history um, of how this these papal ideas start coming into the movement. So these are, again, ideas now that are coming into the movement um, after we had this increase of light with the 2520. And we can see it quite clearly now. Parminder is going to come in um, and start making an impact on the movement with his presentations on the 2520. But all along, he has a plan that's quite different. That is, he's working secretly because he's a liberal. Parminder didn't become a liberal. He always was, but he had to act as a conservative, which is what he said. So those are uh, that he had to he had to use deceit in order to have any influence on the movement. So he had an agenda all the time of what he wanted. Now, in 2019, everything that he had presented in his study on the 2520. He refutes, that is, he, he backs, backtracks, and he says that the seven times is not a duration. And lots of other things, too. He also takes the position um, regarding uh, uh, Atticus Epiphanes, that Atticus Epiphanes uh, is a fulfillment of prophecy. So you have all of these different things that we believed and taught as a movement, and he's going to reject them. But it must be that he never actually believed them. Now, it's hard to believe that somebody could work with that much deceit. But isn't that the way the papacy operates? Yes. Yeah, this is a Jesuit idea. A Jesuit can just go and, and state things that he has no belief in, in order to have an influence. And this is what Parminder does. So um, we don't have a lot of time, but this is what we're going to be looking at. And remember, we have in, in this section, we're going to have two things. We're going to have uh, itself and then the song of Deborah and Barak. Right, and then we're going to have the Midianites. So, um, and we looked at the 20 years, so we're going to look at some of this history as well. Now, it's, it's going to start, that is, this oppression coming into this movement is going to start earlier, but Parminder doesn't really have his, his day until... Um, much later. So you're going to start to see that in 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And so Parmender is not really, most people aren't interested in what he has to say. Now he does, of course, in 2010, or 2012, pardon me, he's going to present his time setting. But that's going to put him in most people's bad books. So how he managed to get out of that within three years, um, I found kind of interesting. So there was a lot of uh, political maneuvering behind the scenes that I don't think Jeff was aware of until much later. So it, it, it's, I mean, I, I sometimes wish I knew all the things that went on to really understand it. All we have is what was done publicly. We don't, we don't really know what was done privately. We know a little bit because I know that Tabo and um, 
Parminder were part of a secret Bible study group, but I didn't know who was in that group. Um, and of course, the people that were in that group were um, uh, quite varied. And the and Tessa's mother in Australia was involved in connection with with uh, Parminder. So whether they both were liberals pretending to be conservatives, I have no idea. And why people would do that, other than that they have an agenda that is not about truth, um, that's the only thing that I can see is that they would have to have a belief system that's quite different than what we have. Because we're interested only in truth. Right? I mean, I cannot understand somebody who's not interested in truth. I just can't comprehend what that would mean. It does boggle the mind. Yeah, but I mean, it's like if a person lies and gives false reasons, well, they would have to know that their reasons are false and that their decision or their choice must be wrong. Uh, you just can't, you can't arrive at truth uh, by presenting error. You can't be duplicitous if you want to know the tr truth. You have to be open and honest, as open as the day. Everything has to be examined under God's purview, under through his Holy Spirit, instructing and guiding us. So, you know, we have this situation that arose in this movement, and it is, it occurs over quite a long period of time, exactly where we would place it. Um, and I would say that we can take these 20 years as a symbol and we can mark because we did that. So we will look at that. Um, we can mark exactly where this occurred and how to understand it. So this would, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly when Parminder came into the movement, but I think it would have been in the 1990s sometime. Stephen, do you know much about Parminder's involvement in the movement? Yeah, I think it was in the 1990s. He, uh, Jeff had done a presentation somewhere up in the Washington area. Okay. Where he was living. So I, I think probably about maybe 96 around that time. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. So it's pretty early on. Um, yes. But Jeff knew him for a long time. But he was more not, not a prominent figure in the movement. Uh, do you know when Parminder started presenting and doing studies? I don't know. And when did you come into the movement? I first, I, I first started watching Jeff and DVD in 2009, but I didn't really make contact with others until about 2015. Okay. Yeah, now you had Parminder presenting as well after that time, right? Like in 2015, when did you hear Parminder for the first time? Well, uh, he was at a camp meeting in Wales that I went to there, 2015. Yeah, yeah that's um, what I thought. Yeah, I think I might have, I think I was aware of Perminder beforehand. I had mm -hmm. watched some of his presentations before. Yeah, probably the 2520 presentation. Well, in 2014, he was uh, presenting with Jeff in the Wales again. Oh. And uh, certainly then. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's some of this history, you know, we kind of have a bit of an understanding of. Okay, so we're our time is up. We're going to come back to this tomorrow. Hopefully, I'm feeling a bit better and I'm not coughing. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, 
Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we had to study. We know that we have to spend time examining these things again, and our memory is faulty. Help us to sort through these judges and to understand where these fall in the lines. Uh, we pray, Lord, for each person that you can watch over them, for those searching for truth. And um, we just ask that you can bring us together again to study your word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.